This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. I can hear me arna. Na mari na nari David. Na arti yunku yaku. Na kunjuri takandi naichu wardly. Na putli naicha na wagadi war garna me arna. Me putli naichu kunyan tapati. For those of you who find accents difficult, um, what I just said is, uh, hello, my name is David. I'm not originally from this country, but I'm very proud to call it my home. And I tell you this in the language of the Garna people as a mark of my respect. Uh, the meeting tonight is held on Garna land. The Garna people have performed ceremonies on this land for many centuries, and we pay our respect to their living culture and the unique role that they play in the life of the Adelaide region. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, you're all very welcome here this evening. Uh, before I begin, I would ask you all to join with me in uh, turning off your phone. And I am doing this because I have been sharing things when my wife was wrong to see where I was. And uh, it really doesn't make for good podcasts as you try to fumble through your phone uh, silencing routine. Um, or as an assistant mobile goes off in the course of our recording. Investing in innovation and economic growth during a downturn makes sense. It means that when the world economy improves, you're positioned to take advantage of that improvement. Now, slowing growth in China may be affecting our mining industry and our royalties today, but there is cause for optimism. There's a very long list of Australian industries which lend themselves to the commercialization and export of their innovation and the provision of smarter services. That's where our future economic growth and jobs will come from. And that's where our focus nationally should be. How do we do this? Peter Beattie suggests we start with the future of mining, whose jobs growth will come from exporting mining services. Peter Beattie was one of those rare politicians who was almost as well known outside his home state as he was inside it. And his name still resonates, which makes it initially a little surprising to realize that it is now more than eight years since he stepped down as Queensland's premier. Undefeated in four successive elections, Three of them won very convincingly, fourth one close enough, but very much at the top of his game. It's still a little less surprising, however, when you consider that the name resonates when you see what he gets up to these days. His words and his ideas resonate strongly with the Australian public. He's a regular commentator on Sky News. He co-hosts a program on Sky with the former Coalition Cabinet Minister Peter Reith. He writes opinion pieces for The Australian, uh, among others. And he pops up now and then as a guest on Channel 7 Sunrise or the ABC's Q&A, uh, which perhaps, as much as any outlet, suits his style and personality. And as if he needed a day job, just a few weeks back, Peter was named to head the corporation that will run the 2018 Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast. Peter Beattie was, and still is, a very influential as well as colourful Australian. As State Premier, he was not only one of our most successful leaders, but also a man of great vision. His mission was to make Queensland Australia's smart state by restructuring the education system, skilling the workforce, encouraging research and development, and striving to at attract and retain and grow high-tech industries such as biotechnology, IT and aviation. Peter had a very clear vision for the future and went full steam after it. His efforts certainly impressed the University of Queensland, which in 2003 awarded him an honorary doctorate in recognition of his leadership and commitment to higher education through the Smart State Initiative and his support for research. Two years prior to this, in 2001, he was awarded the Centenary Medal for his contribution to Queensland more broadly. Five years after that, in 2008, the year uh, after standing down as Premier, he won the Biotechnology Industry Organization's inaugural International Award for Leadership Excellence. And as someone who was active in the biotechnology sector globally at the time, I can attest to Peter putting Queensland very firmly on the map, on the world stage, uh, in that domain. Since then, Peter has continued to contribute actions and ideas which are designed to make the world work more effectively and efficiently, and to make all of us think more about how to do things better. He served as Queensland's Trade Commissioner to North and South America. He was Australia's first resource sector supply envoy. And he spent time as an advisor and guest lecturer on the Global Economic Development Strategy at Clemson University in South Carolina, who also awarded him an honorary degree. Today, he's the director of the Medical Research Commercialization Fund, ambassador for Life Sciences Queensland, and a joint adjunct professor at the University of Queensland's AIBN, that's the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology, 
and the Institute for Molecular Biosciences. In his spare time, of which I'm sure there's very little, he has also a writer and an author, with both an autobiography making a difference and a political thriller, The Year of Dangerous Ones, to his credit. The plot teaser of one of those books is as follows, and I quote, political staffers close to the Premier of the Australian state of Queensland start turning up dead. I leave you to decide which book it is, but we're all in trouble if it's the autobiography. Peter's most recent book, Where To From Here Australia, released February this year, expands on his strategy for turning Queensland into a smart state and maps out a new vision for Australia based on innovation and the long-term investment in commercialization of our research. We couldn't think of a better topic for a lecture, and I think it's very fair to say that Peter was up near the very top of our list when we sat down to decide who to invite to deliver an address in this, our 25th birthday year. In 2012, Peter was named a Companion of the Order of Australia for eminent services to Parliament of, and community of Queensland through initiatives in the area of education and training, economic development, particularly biotechnology, information technology and aviation industries, and to the promotion of international trade. And I'm quite sure he'll be canvassing a few of those ideas here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in welcoming the Honourable Peter Beattie AC. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let me start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and say that uh, I was delighted, David, to accept your invitation. Thank you. I heard the University of South Australia had this absolutely dynamic Vice-Chancellor, so I really wanted to come and have a look. And I'm not disappointed. I wish you well. I wanted to talk to you tonight about Australia's future and to hopefully stimulate some of your questions and to share some of the ideas that I have which I think are important. The issue for Australia is very simply this. We are really smart. If you just pause for a minute and think of all the things that we've invented, it doesn't take very long. Wi-Fi, black box, the list goes on and on and on. And then just think, how many of those were actually commercialised in Australia? How many of them were actually taken somewhere else in the world to be commercialised? And then you realise there's something structurally wrong with our economy and how we approach things. I just want to keep, ask you to keep that thought in mind as I go through what I'm suggesting to you tonight. When I wrote the book that David referred to, the one about where to from here, Australia, this one, Heather and I were living in the United States. I spent two years as a trade commissioner, as David indicated, and then we spent three years in North Carolina with the University of the university there, Clemson University, and then we spent two years in New York. So in those seven years, we had an opportunity to have a look at what was happening in the US, what was happening in China, I was on a board out of Hong Kong at the time, but then also to have a look at Australia externally, because sometimes we actually get caught up too much in who we are. And out of that, and out of those experiences, I wrote this book. But as writing it, I wanted to have a look at what was happening in parts of America, the success stories. You always hear about the, the, the success stories in San Francisco and what they've done and Silicon Valley and all that. You know all about that. But we thought we'd look at the bad side as well as the good side. And when we were living in New York, the city of Detroit declared itself bankrupt, the biggest bankruptcy in American history. So we went to have a look. We spent some time there because I, I couldn't quite understand what had happened in the American culture, what had happened in Detroit. Because those of you who know anything about Detroit, when you think about Detroit, what do you think about? Cars. You think about Henry Ford. You think about innovation. And Henry Ford was not just an assembly line. It was also about agricultural equipment. It was a very extensive. He was also into aircraft. It was a broad agenda. And, you know, he had some weird ideas, which I won't go through. We don't need to go down these anti-Semitic views and a few other things he had. But when it came to innovation, that was where the motor vehicle industry was. So what happened? When we visited there, we found Detroit was a really sad place. And these are photos that I took, and I don't claim to be a great photographer, so just bear with me. This is downtown Detroit, and there are 80 thousand abandoned buildings. Now, when Heather and I, my wife, were in the heart of the city, this is one of the buildings we found. This is in the heart of Detroit. 
This is not somewhere out in the suburbs. This is in the heart of Detroit. And I took this photo because it had care on the side of the building and I just thought that was a bit ironic. This is another building right in the heart of Detroit. Now if you take the period from the late 50s and 60s when realistically the, the, the trend started to develop, the adverse trend, a million people from then right through till now actually left Detroit. One million people actually left this city. Crime went through the roof and in fact the crime rate in Detroit's ten times that of New York, which gives you some idea of the breakdown in the social fabric in the city. And here I took this photo and I tried to be as sensitive as possible because frankly I didn't want to take advantage of homeless people. This photograph was taken right in front of the headquarters, the world headquarters of General Motors. There were in fact uh, three homeless people we were there in winter trying to warm themselves. You know in the, in the US they have these vents where the, the steam comes out. So if you are homeless, what you try and do is get around a vent to keep warm. And I just thought the symbolism of this was just tragic in a way. Homeless people trying to warm themselves on a vent right in the front of the headquarters of General Motors. So what actually went wrong? It was very clear to me, and that you can look at these things and you can, you can dissect them in many ways, but what basically happened was they lost their, their mojo, to use a terrible colloquialism, but they actually lost their commitment to innovation. And they lost the inability to change. That's the key to it. They got in a position where they were dominant in the world, but they didn't change as the world changed. Now, Competition came out of Japan, they didn't respond. Then came automotive parts and their industry didn't respond. So in other words, they became uncompetitive. So they were not innovative. They did not change and they did not innovate. And again, I ask you to remember that the focus of this about innovation. Now, a little further away, about four and a half hours drive, is another city called Pittsburgh. And when you think about Pittsburgh, what do you think about? Steel, exactly. Now, that was another industry that went through a huge competition, and we've seen this in Australia. And I want you to think about how these themes apply to us as I go through them, and I think you're starting to get the picture here. But what did Pittsburgh do? Pittsburgh didn't sit there. It didn't stagnate. What they did in Pittsburgh, they started to innovate. They moved to medical science. They moved to research. They found different industries. I'll come back to that. They started to change. Now, admittedly, the steel industry shrank. There are still some mills in the outskirts, outskirts of Pittsburgh, but they diversed into education. They diversed into a whole series of industries, of professions. So going from Detroit, which you can only really describe as a city in decay, to the vibrancy of Pittsburgh, four and a half hours down the road, was actually going almost through totally different mindsets. So the key that I got from that, and I deal with it in, in the book, is this need to continue to innovate, this need to continue to be able to cope with change. And if any of you have an opportunity to go to Detroit or Pittsburgh, do the drive. Four and a half hours, and it's a drive through a totally different mindset. Totally different mindset. So let me come back to Australia, because the parallels are really simple. We're going through a post-mining boom. You can equate it to Detroit if you want to. You've seen what's happened in South Australia in terms of the steel industry, the motor vehicle industry, same things happen in Queensland, same things happen in Western Australia. So the issue for us is, there's no point sitting and saying, all right, look, we're in a post-mining boom. In the same way, there's no point Detroit saying, hang on, we've suddenly got big competitors from Japan, and that's ugly and unpleasant. We have to find a way to innovate. We have to find a way to change. But to do that, you've got to understand what's right and what's wrong with the economy and the country. Just have a quick look at this. I don't want to bore you with these things, but just have a look. 
On that graph, the thing to point out is this. Mining actually doesn't employ a lot of people. Have a look at the, the, the graph at the bottom there. Agriculture's gone up and down. That's started to improve a little bit since then. Construction, well, it depends on how much money is going into construction. Manufacturing's dropped away. But what's the big boost there? Services. Service industry. So you can see the nature of our economy is changing. Now, mining industry, as you can see, is roughly only around, it's less than, you know, 2% of all jobs. Now, that's different to mining services, and I'll come back to that, but I'm talking about mining. But have a look at where the growth are, growth, the growth factors are. Medical and pharmaceutical products, 12%. You can see vehicle specialised machinery, transport equipment. A lot of these are specialised areas which are starting to play their part in terms of exports. A lot of people wouldn't know that medical and pharmaceutical products are huge exports for us. And in fact, pharmaceutical manufacturing is now the largest, one of our largest exporters. It employs 40,000 people. So when you think about universities and you think about research and you think about pharmaceuticals and all those things, they are real job generators. And universities, which I'm a strong supporter of, are not just a place for education. They're a place for research, innovation and creating drivers in the economy. Now, so let's talk about what we're really smart about. I said at the beginning, think of all the things we've invented which have been commercialised offshore or developed by someone else. If you have a look at where we are, relative to our size, Australia continues to produce a huge amount of quality scientific output. We're really clever. Our universities are really good, our institu institutes are really good. You can read the graph, but in reality, that's what it says. If you look at biotechnology, and as David indicated, I'm a director of the Medical Research Commercialisation Fund, which is the biggest investor in, in medical research in, in Australia. It's based in Melbourne, but it invests across Australia, including in this state, and I'll come back to that. You can see how well we rank. But let's have a look at this. The French Business School, NSEED, every year, does uh, an assessment, it doesn't matter what year you pick, the results are basically the same. They have a look at what is, who are the smart innovators? And they've got various ways to do it. To look at innovation input, innovation output, doesn't matter how you look at that, they're just indicators of how smart you are. But if you have a look at this, you'll see that Australia's ranking is about 28 and a half. So that's an average between the input and output. The bottom line there basically is that means we're pretty clever. But have a look at the index below, and this rates over 142 countries. We are 116. So why are we that low when it comes to being efficiency? Because efficiency basically means taking a smart idea, commercialising it, turning it into a company, growing that company, and creating jobs and opportunities. Why are we so bad at it? Why are we so smart? yet so bad at commercialising our ideas. Because that's the real challenge we face in this country. That's what's wrong, basically, with where we are structurally. The answer lies basically here. We spend around about, let's say, $10 billion on research in Australia every year. And you can see, if you look, you can see basically the past history of it. But look at the, the little box on the right. Only 1.5% 1, 1 of that money is spent on commercialising the research. Now that's not the American model. It's not the UK model, it's not the German model, it's not the French model, and it's not the Chinese model either. I mean, we have a, some people have a weird view about what's happening in China. China is actually spending an enormous amount on biotech. They are spending a fortune, fortune both on industrial biotech and medical biotech, because they understand that knowledge is going to be the big driver of economic growth. In fact, this century, knowledge will create more than 50% of all jobs and more than 50% of all economic growth. Brain power, brain power. That's what will drive the future. And that's why this is what's wrong with our country. We are not spending enough when it comes to economic growth. We're not spending enough when it comes to commercialising, to turn our research into economic growth. Now, let me 
Now talk about what the opportunities are. Everybody talks about the Asian century and where we are in Asia, and that's a given. I don't think anyone argues against it. But what does it mean for us, tangibly? I mean, at the moment we export a lot of iron ore, a lot of coal, and we all get terrified and the share market goes up and down like this whenever the price for iron ore or coal goes down, and that's all fine. But in the end, we all know that the Chinese economy is doing what we're doing. We're moving, we're moving to a service industry economy, and so are the Chinese. So in other words, at some point, they're not going to need as much iron ore and as, and as much coal as they currently do. Forget about the arguments about renewables, but you know, I'll come back to that in a minute because the Chinese are spending a fortune on renewables too. I mean, it's just not going to keep sucking up coal. They're spending a lot on renewables. They're pretty clever. So if you look at what's going to happen, you're getting a huge increase in the middle class in Asia. When I left law school 100 years ago, uh, the reality is if you'd have said to anybody China's going to be a dynamic economy or India's going to be a dynamic economy or Malaysia or Singapore or Indonesia or any of these countries, they would have laughed at you. You would have thought you're the village idiot. Well, not anymore. There's a growing middle class in China, a growing middle class in India, and of course there's a lot of poor people. We understand that. But the reality is they are so populous that when you've got a certain percentage of your population that's middle class, you're talking about 250 million people. You're talking about a lot of people. Now, as they age, what do they want? Aged care, health care, pharmaceuticals. That's what they want. Now, what are we good at? We're really good at it, other than we don't commercialise it terribly well. We're very good at that. So what you've got on the doorstep, and this is why I call this opportunity, is a huge amount a huge growth. Look at this. Here's the, the little red boxes are off a low base, but as you can see, 297% uh, growth in 11 years in Korea. That's just one country. And of course, they are going to accelerate. So if we want to grow beyond the mining boom, we have to invest in research in our universities, in our institutes, so that we can provide the pharmaceuticals, provide the aged care, provide the services. And when I talk about pharmaceuticals, it's not just drugs. It's also support services. It's, and, and, and you know what that means in terms of aged cares, but it's also medical technologies, tests for, for various diseases. And we all know that the iPhone eventually, the Koreans are doing a lot of this now, you're going to have DNA sequencing a lot quicker. Everyone will be able to do it really quickly and cheaply. And our iPhones, eventually, you'll be able to put a bit of spit on it, or you might even prick your finger a little bit. They'll be able to see your sugar levels. They'll be able to not only do that, they'll be able to do DNA sequencing off it eventually. It'll all be done so clear, and you'll be able to monitor your heart. You'll be able to do everything from that little phone in your hand. Now, if you think that's nonsense, just remember where we've come in my lifetime. And some of you are in my age group. I can tell by your look. You can tell by mine. So you know that little device which can do amazing things with the internet, that is going to control. And you look at where the number of iPhones in the world are just phenomenal. They're increasing all the time. There's a big push in the United States for personal medicine. Personal medicine because the health system in the United States is so dysfunctional, and it is dysfunctional. It's, they've got the best and the worst in the one country, and they pay more per head than anyone else, and they get the worst outcomes. So personal medicine is a driver in the United States. That's why the iPhone and anything that's developed by the Koreans or the Chinese, Americans will pick it up like that. And when you've got a market like that, of course, someone in Korea or someone in China is actually going to develop that technology. So I come back to my point. We are in a great position to provide the pharmaceuticals, the aged care for this growing middle class in Asia, people on our in our neighbourhood, and they don't have, it's, we are close enough for them to travel to come here. So, the Medical Research Commercialisation Fund I talked about before, I'm going to come back to in a minute. One of our biggest problems is not just that we're bad at commercialising and that we only spend 1.5% on commercialising, we are actually, we do not have enough venture capital in this country. Superannuation funds, the managers who run them, frankly, are on performance uh, criteria that means that they have to give quick returns and all of you want a good return on your super fund, so you don't want to have high risk, so they invest in roads in Europe, 
They invest in places that don't add to the value of this country. That's actually not good. And I've spoken to the superannuation industry. I addressed the national conference. And you probably could have heard a pin drop when I said, if you keep investing like this, where are your members going to come from? If you don't have future growth and future jobs, where is the future of your super funds? Now, we've got one of the biggest retirement industries in the world. Trillion dollar industry. I know it's political football, and we can talk about that later, and I don't want to get into that. Well, not here yet. Happy to do later. But while it's a political football, we've got all this money. And the managers who run it, they get paid bonuses based on the return. They don't think strategically. They don't think long term. They don't have to. They take their money and they run. So that's the first problem. We do not have enough venture capital. What I'd like to see is, I'd like to see superannuation funds, I'd like to see their boards actually write out to all of you as members and say, would you be prepared to invest something like 0.2% of 1% of your money in the future of your country, in a future fund? So in other words, they establish a fund, it might be, bear in mind how big the superannuation industry is, it might be, you know, four or five hundred thousand four or five hundred million dollars, but you yourself may, if your super fund is worth a million dollars, you might be putting a thousand dollars in, or two thousand dollars, sorry. So for you it's actually a small contribution, but if Australians all did it, you would get a whole lot of money, huge funds that could be invested in our research institutes that could commercialise our brain power and sell the health funds to Europe. Now, I don't want to be too critical of the superannuation industry, because the Medical Research Commercialisation Fund, of which I'm a director, has finally got the superannuation industry to put some money in. Now, it's not a huge amount, but they are, they are putting in a few hundred million. And that's why the Medical Research Commercialisation Fund, the MRCF, this body here, is the biggest investor in medical research in Australia. And that sounds wonderful, and we can beat our chest, but you know what? In world terms, that's chicken feed. That's chicken feed. Now you can see the way that the MRCF operates because the biggest problem that superannuation funds have is they don't, they're, they're into low risk, right? So they, managing risk is the criteria and that's the big concern about where, where they invest. That's why they invest in roads in Europe and, and, and the United States because it's secure and they'll get a return. But the MRCF has a track record of actually selling a couple of, well, a number of major research outcomes. In fact, I'll give you two. The, the, uh, uh, there was a fund called Spinifex, uh, a, a, uh, some researchers out of the University of Queensland. It's a drug that manages chronic pain. The MRCF invested in it and they've sold it recently for $700 million. They did a similar one in Melbourne, Fibertech, $557 million. So you can see there's a lot of money in them. And that, those successes encouraged the superannuation industry to put more money into the MRCF. And what the MRCF does is very cleverly go to these research institutes. And you can see over here, South Australia, you've got four who are members of the MRCF. All the institutes, the best institutes, are actually members of the MRCF. And the MRCF basically, it doesn't have a legal first right of call, but the, they the institutes, if they have some research break, breakthroughs, they'll go to the MRCF and they'll end up giving early funding. They'll then match other funding. So in other words, it's trying to get the best out of our researchers. But the funds are not big enough. They're still not big enough. Yes, we have millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, but not, not enough. Nowhere near enough. So what I would like to see, and it's one of the things I advocate in the book, so we have to actually say strategically, OK, where are we going to be in the future? We are going to have huge partnerships with China, whether we like it or not. We have to change the nature of that relationship. You can't just simply keep selling them coal and iron ore. We have to go to a different level of sophistication. I'd like to see a joint investment fund established between Australia and China. I'd like to see a couple of them, where we take Chinese money, and they have money. They have a lot of foreign reserves. We have brain power. Our science is actually better in many senses than the Chinese at the moment, but that won't last for long, maybe five years if we're lucky. So we've got a window of opportunity. And I'd like to see some joint funds. Australian brains, Chinese money, based in Australia, where they invest in obviously medical science, but also innovation generally, and we share the proceeds from the IP. Now, you know, there are people in this country that have a Chinese phobia. I'm not one of them. 
course I like to see, see Australians do very well, but based on the track record, we've had about innovation where every, everything of any substance we've invested, we've flogged off somewhere else. We need to find a better model. And that's why I think it's useful for us to take advantage of where we are in the world, but that window of opportunity will pass. And it's like everything else, when I talked about Detroit, you know, I, I see a lot of our research institutes, including our universities, and I know David's not in this category, who say, oh, look, we've got this long-term strategy to bring Asian students here forever. Hello? That is not going to happen forever because Chinese universities are going to start going to the world. And they are partnering. I saw this in the United States when I was involved in the university sector there. They'll partner with uh, American universities. They'll use the brand name and they will go to the world. I mean, in the end of it, China is so big that they'll have research collaborations between Shanghai, Nanjing, Beijing, you name it. And they'll, they will be able, they will become a power in terms of export education themselves. The world will not stand still. And if we think the education sector, which is incredibly big, it's bigger than tourism in this country in terms of export dollars, if we think it's going to stay the way it is now, we're dreaming. You know, joint degrees, co-location of universities, we have to actually integrate a lot of what we do. Otherwise, we will actually get left behind. So, having a joint venture fund, a couple of them, is an extension of what we need to do. So, let me move on and talk about, so where will the jobs come from? It's all very well to talk about the innovation in the space that I've talked about. In my view, I think advanced manufacturing, hence the decision about submarines in South Australia is a good decision. I've got to be honest, in the world in which we live, if anyone thinks that our submarines are going to make one, <laughs> one difference when it comes to defence of this country, you're deluding yourself. I mean, we live in a nuclear age. You know, by the time they're finished, they will be probably out of date. I support them not because of their military deterrent. I don't believe any of that nonsense. I actually, what I like about it, and uh, David mentioned the, the show uh, Beatty and Reith, which is on Wednesday nights. We had the French ambassador on this week, and we interviewed him. And it was really interesting. They are committed to technology uh, transfer. They're committed to growing local companies in South Australia. That's where the grunt is. You know the big mistake we made with the motor industry over a long period of time, and some of you won't like me saying this, we did not transfer that technology out outside the motor vehicle industry, because it's actually a really innovative industry. We should, and we don't do enough with defence either. Americans do it take defence technology and transfer it into other industries. We did a deal with Boeing. I got Boeing when I was Premier to locate their headquarters in Brisbane. Part of the deal was, yes, you come, we'll support you, but you've got to work with Queensland companies to grow them. It's exactly what happens. There's a whole network of them. So South Australia is going to do incredibly well out of submarines if state and federal governments are smart enough to continue to work through in partnership with universities in partnership with universities, because that's where you've got to keep thinking about how do I get the maximum advantage out of this? I just can't, can't sit still and say these are the opportunities now. They may be totally different in 18 months, two years. That's why advanced manufacturing, food and agribusiness, you already know that, it's a given. It's a given. But we need to look at smarter things, better packaging, longer life on shelves. We need to look at better transport systems. It's not just about food anymore. It's not just about producing it better, it's about keeping it at shelf life longer, adding and accessing other, other markets. Medical technologies and pharmaceuticals I've already talked about. Mining equipment, technology and services. It's really important that we differentiate between mining and mining services. Now, in my experience as a trade commissioner, when I went through Latin America, the Canadians and the Australians had the best technology in the world. But it will not stand still. We'll have competition from China, South Africa. When the Russians finally get their act together, they will as well. But mining's changing. If you look at the oil, for example, it's off the Brazilian coast, it's deeper than before. A lot of our mines, you've got to go deeper, you've got to have better technology to actually get access to the ore. And you also, in, in most of the Latin American countries, which is why you see arguments from time to time, the, lo the local indigenous populations are quite rightly demanding that mining has to be done in an environmentally friendly way. The local communities have to benefit from health and education. And they want to see that their land returned to the same state it was in before the mine actually happened. Now, who's the best country in the world to do that? We are. 
We're really good at this. We've got a whole lot of minds that have gone, been used. We don't talk about them much because they've, they've gone out of existence. But we are actually very good at restoring minds and, and dealing with them. Now, that's a technology in itself that we can sell, not just environmental, not just better you know, driverless trucks, all those sorts of stuff. Oil, gas and energy resources are self-explanatory. Services generally, including aged care, I've already talked about, and tourism. But when it comes to tourism, the world is changing again. It's so competitive, tourism. There are so many countries that are now offering tourism services. But we, we are good at environmental tourism. We're also good at training and skilling. That has to be how we look at tourism, not just getting people to come here. We have to look at the skills that we can offer. And education, well, I've already talked about that, you know about that. The other thing that I want to briefly say is if we don't go down this innovative path, path we will get left behind and our kids and grandkids will not enjoy the standard of living we do because there are going to be a number of disruptors. Spatio-technology will disrupt us, uh, biotech I've talked about and nanotechnology, they're the three disruptors and they will change the world in which we live. Now, I, can, I won't go through them but they are key changes that will, will change where we are. The final thing that I wanted to say is that, and I've talked a little bit about um, driverless cars and trucks, you've all already seen the world and how that's changing. It's also robotics. Uh, the Queensland University of Technology, where I have a relationship, they've now got uh, farming techniques that are revolutionising farming. They've even got technology that goes out and kills the crown of thorns, starfish on the reef. It's all done by robotics. They've got food packing. The whole thing goes on and on and on. So, that is going to change our world. The real question for us is, while it's changing the world, are we going to be part of it or are we going to be buyers of that technology? And I often see an argument, and this is a controversial one, I see this argument in, in this country where we say, all right, if we bring in renewables, you're going to pay more for power, electricity. You know, the truth is that's true. You will. But what are the Germans doing? If you go to Germany, you pay more in Germany for electricity than you do in the United States. Germany's price of power is actually reasonably high. But what they're doing is they're going through a total renewable strategy. If the Germans end up with, which I believe they will, basically dominating renewables in this world, guess who's going to be paying them for it? You all are. You all are. And you'll pay for it all right, and your electricity bill which you, you'll bemoan now, will be chicken feed compared to what you'll pay to the Germans. And that's why the Chinese want to work very carefully with, with the Germans. That's why they're going down the road of renewables in a big way. Renewables will change. What we have to do is do the transition from coal and other industries in a clever way, and I have clear views about that. But we have to be innovative, and yes, there are some risks in this, but if you don't develop the technology, you're going to pay for it. Real simple. If you don't develop the technology, you pay someone else for it. And it doesn't matter whether it's energy or whether it's pharmaceuticals or whatever. That's the way that the world will go. Just a couple of other quick things in conclusion because I know time's running out and I want you to have plenty of time to ask me questions. In the book I also deal with some other things about reforms. When you look at all this debate that takes place in the country about who pays what and the deficit, you know one of the great tragedies? is that every year we waste billions of dollars on the Federation. We have one of the most inefficient systems of government imaginable. What's emerged since Australia became a country is that the High Court has repeatedly eroded the powers of the states. Now, I didn't particularly like this when I was a Premier, but that's what's, what's evolved. No point bemoaning it. What it's led to is huge duplication. Now, Tony Abbott, and as you probably gather, I'm not a huge fan, but, but Tony Abbott set up a commission to look at the Federation. It was one of the smartest, probably the only smart thing in my humble view he did. <laughs> but it was the right thing to do because the duplication in education, health, all the services, whether it's environmental approvals, is just a waste of money and you pay for it. It is inefficient. Now, I personally believe we've got to a point in Australia, and this will surprise many of you, that we should actually abolish the states. I'm mindful of the fact that, that I don't like the Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra dominance of our country, and it exists. And being a Queenslander, I just dislike it enormously. But I know how much the current 
federation costs us. Now, I don't think that's going to happen in my lifetime and nor the lifetime of anyone in this room, so I'm a realist. What I'd like to do, though, is to see a broader vision of COAG where all the state governments and the Commonwealth actually sat down and worked out who did what. And it could save us a small fortune. And out of that, the Commonwealth needs to say, look, the states, you can do this, this and this, and the Commonwealth, and the states have to say, I will give up that power for the Commonwealth to do this, this and this. And out of that, it will save you a fortune. The other thing that's crazy in this country is three-year terms for a federal government? I mean, seriously. I don't see any party pushing for four-year terms. Queensland was the last state to have three-year terms, and, and fortunately, the people of Queensland voted recently in a referendum, because it couldn't be done by an act of parliament because of our constitution. They voted for four-year terms. Hallelujah. And Queenslanders are about as cynical and distrustful as politicians as you can get. But they said it's silly to have three-year terms. Yet we have three-year terms in the Commonwealth. And you've got to say, that is just crazy. If you are going to have some leadership on these issues, then you need four years to do it. So I would hope that eventually we'll get to the point where our politicians will do something constructive. Finally, let me conclude my remarks by saying this. I was really delighted when Malcolm Turnbull spelled out his innovation policy because it was a very kin to the smart state thing that I'd pursued in Queensland years ago. I liked what he did with tax breaks and I said so. I also liked the fact that Bill Shorten in his budget reply set out an agenda which was also about innovation. Because you know what? If we don't get some bipartisan commitment to innovation and research long term, it just gets caught up in the idiocy of politics. But you know what happened? I went from being excited, as Malcolm Turnbull was, and delighted with Bill Shorten to a position where, what happened to it? I mean, it's fallen off the agenda. And when it falls off the agenda, what happens? You get people and, and, you know, people say to me, why did Pauline Hanson win a Senate seat? Pauline Hanson won a Senate seat because our, both our leaders, I'll be totally bipartisan about this, have not engaged enough with people who are suffering under the old economy. And I'll tell you where Pauline Hanson's support comes from. It's blue-collar workers who are post-mining boom who are terrified about their jobs and want their family and kids to have some security. It's small business operators who are doing it tough who aren't able to know where their future is. It's farmers who are not benefiting from the free trade agreements who don't quite understand where they're going to fit in. And it's also people, perhaps in my age group or a bit younger, who are just worried about their own security. You know, people talk about race and look, I, I, clearly I don't like what Pauline Hanson says about race, but most of her supporters aren't racist. Most of her supporters, and I, I saw them when I first got elected to, to Premier, I had a minority government. One Nation got 23% of the primary vote and had 11 members in, in, in the parliament. And these 11 members who came in didn't have three heads. They weren't terribly, terribly well informed. They weren't people of the world. They were trying to live in a world that had gone and that had passed. But they were there because of insecurity. They were there because they were worried about their future. So the real key to what I'm trying to say to you today is this agenda is a great one. And I think Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten would probably agree with it if they spent enough time to think about it but it needs bipartisanship and a long-term commitment and we have to work with those people in the old economy as the transition is made. But no one in this room or anywhere else should be under any illusions. We are going to be part of this transition of whether we like it or not. We either lead on it, we either do it willingly, and we either be a leader of it, or as I said before, we'll be buying German technology in renewables and we'll be buying Chinese technology in renewables and pharmaceuticals and we will be a beach. We'll be a great beach, we'll be a wonderful country to live in and our kids will have a terrible standard of living. Thank you very much. I'd love to, yeah, thank you. Now, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, we have plenty of time for questions, and uh, I'll, I'll give a little commentary later on as I close with a vote of thanks. We have some microphones, um, and I'm going to try and corral people to, uh, to deliver our questions. I think the easiest thing to do will be, if you've got a question, stand up, we'll get a mic to you. There's one here in the front, here in the red, straight off. 
Yes, hello. Uh, the one I want to talk about is uh, the encouragement of innovation in, in science. It seems there's a lot of uh, bias towards pushing, which is more looks more like applied science, and less towards fundamental science. <coughs> now, applied science really is based on or needs fundamental science, but if you uh, don't support fundamental science, in it, it can you can be decades behind. It can take a long time, obviously, for fundamental science to. A, a, achieve something, like the laser for instance, that's worth billions of dollars, but uh, that was developed in the 60s. Um, there's, you know, what, what do we do now if, if uh, there is less emphasis on uh, supporting fundamental science? The answer to your question is, you're right, and I've confronted this debate over a long period of time, and you don't need to go into a university very, for more than 10 minutes to know that this is a matter of some debate. The truth is you're right, and it's all about strategy, and it's about a partnership, and both of them can work together, in my view. And one of the things that I'd like to see, uh, it, but, but it, there shouldn't really be a debate. I mean, I understand why there's a debate, I understand why this discussion takes place, but if the university's got a good strategic position, or the research institute, you marry both of them together, but you can't also move away from commercialisation. Because some people who put that argument actually argue against commercialisation. They're both important. Because in the end, if you look at all the major research institutes in the United States, the ones that have been successful, they live a lot, a lot off their IP. When I was at Clemson, they, uh, the state government, because uh, the uh, Tea Party basically in the state cut back the funding to the university, so what they did is go out to their alumni and raised a billion dollars. And they raised a lot of money from people who, who had IP, who'd had commercial, commercialised some of their research. And that's how the university got. Now, I don't know any university in Australia that could do that. And this is, only, this is, not, this is they're number 22 or 23 in the US in terms of universities. So they're not, they're not the top group, but they're right in the middle. So I could give you a more long-winded answer, but the truth is both are important and a university should accommodate both as the answer. Oh, we just got one question. We go over the microphone. It's up the back, right? Hello. Um, do you believe there are some industries, and I'll say the steel industry in particular, that uh, we should just give up on? I is it the right thing to put two hundred million dollars into trying to rescue that industry? Or you know, I'll use that as an example. But it, across the board, in any industry that's using old technologies hasn't kept up and, and faces huge competition from overseas. Do we try and rescue them or do we better invest money that we pour into them into developing new industries and new technologies? Good question. But you know the way to approach the answer? The answer to that is this. If we're nimble and we're clever, you anticipate some of the changes. You don't do a Detroit. We did a Detroit in our own car industry. That's what happened to us. Let's be really honest. We just kept giving subsidies. We didn't think what else we could do. We didn't think how you could value add, how you can expand the industry and do other things. Uh, you know, the whole world is changing so rapidly. I mean, my wife and I talk about this occasionally. We think of all the changes that have taken place in our lifetime. And you can all think of the same thing, the revolutions that have taken place. Well, that's going to continue to happen. So the answer is, because government has been short-sighted and just looked at industries when they're in trouble, then you get the rescue packages. You've got to have a long-term strategic view of saying, all right, I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm particularly clever, but there's industries I've spelled out. You can just see what's happening in world trends. You can see what's going to happen. I mean, we need to be really smart at high end. So actually investing in the submarines was, is a clever decision. We should have done something in vehicles a long time ago. When you get to the point where you're, you're up against it, then of course you're going to end up closing an industry. So. There, but no one should be under any illusions, though. Industries will go through radical change, and you need to be able to go with the change. And I'll give you an example. When I was in office, we brought in national identification for beef, tags in the ears. And we did it because the Americans had foot and mouth disease, and we were, we, they used to block us largely out of the Japanese market. And I went to Agforce, who's the body that looks after farmers, and said to them, we need to actually do the paddock to plate thing. 
This is before everyone had heard of it, because the Japanese wanted to go, because they, they're fussy about food, they wanted to go in and they wanted to use their phone so the people could see where the, where the beef came from, where it had been in the paddock and where, and where it was in their supermarket. Now, what happened was when I, I went to the Ag Force conference, and because we had to move quickly, that is, we had to convince all the, the, the various uh, commercial retailers in, in Japan that we, we were going to do this so that they'd do long-term contracts. We didn't have the, the time to go through a long-term consultation, so we actually decided to do it as a government. We spoke to Agforce and I went and announced it at their conference. 60% of people got it like that. Another 10 or 15 took a bit longer. Another 20% thought I was the reincarnation of the devil. <laughs> so, you know, the problem is, it's, you know, change is never easy, but you've got to be strategic. Now, of course, what happens in the world? Everybody does it now. National identification for, for beef does all over the world, and we actually sell our technology to the world. Now, I'm not trying to say I'm clever. I mean, I was given good advice by my Director General, who's now the Vice Chancellor of Melbourne University. So I had a smart guy giving me advice. But at the end, that's what we have to do. You've got to anticipate what will happen in a market and change. And we actually didn't do it in the car industry. We didn't do it in steel. Look, I was, as, as David mentioned, I was an envoy for the Gillard government to get more contract work for the steel industry and our suppliers when all the work was being done in, in Queensland for gas and in Western Australia. And this will make me really unpopular, but our steel industry was so inflexible. You know, I used to go to the suppliers and say, well, why, why don't you buy more Australian steel? Well, they're not flexible about what I can actually buy. They give me their limited sort of specifications and not the specifications I want. When I went to uh, Houston, because Houston was where a lot of procurement's done for major projects, you know, when you talk to them, it was about our inflexibility to provide a more flexible product. You know, you live in a world where you have to be flexible. Now, I gave a report which was so probably unhelpful and controversial, it's gathering dust somewhere in Canberra. But the reality is, we have to be able to cope with change. We have to be flexible. We have to change our model. You can't just put steel out at the same inflexible model. You've got to offer what the people, you know, what the consumers want, building our projects. I've never said that publicly, so I'm, I'm sure that'll become really interesting. Okay, we're recording. I'm hoping I can ask three questions to do universities, please. The first is, is it lunacy that our major parties have cut back funding to our universities and just seem to be keeping it low there. Uh, secondly, do academics have enough real freedom or are they driven by the short-term imperative of making profits, maybe like what you were saying with the superannuation industry? And thirdly, is there something we can do about student debt so that um, it actually encourages people to go into universities rather than to have this big impediment even before, well, once they start? They're all three good questions. Let me just give you a, a, uh, my response, and this is just my view. I don't speak on behalf of any political party. I'm retired from politics. But universities, it is about a culture of innovation, not just in the community but in our universities. We're actually pretty well served by our universities, I have to say. Um, you know, someone who spent time in American universities, my wife and I, who's a professor in her own right, we actually do think we're, we're nimble. We, we must say, we, we, when we're at one of the universities, not one that we've referred to, uh, we were quite appalled at how a lot of Australian, sorry, sorry, how a lot of American students didn't necessarily have a lot of fundamentals. I mean, Americans are great at teaching their kids how to speak and, hold, and, and talk and be self-confident, which means as, when they're selling something as a comp company, they'll oversell what they've got. But a lot of the students don't have the skills that Australians do, I have to say. Um, look, in terms of freedom, I mean, that depends on what university you're in. I mean, obviously, there's got to be some form of system. I don't know what, what the particular university issues here are, but there's got to be a creative opportunity. And it's not just about making money. It is about making sure that the climate is there to actually share in that IP. I mean, I actually believe that researchers should share in it, both personally, but the university should share in it. So you create this whole environment of, of uh, innovation and creativity, and that's a culture that I'm talking about within a university. I don't like to see huge 
uh, debt, I have to say, from students. But let me give you, again, a view that is not certainly a Labor Party view. We have to face up to the fact that our universities are really underfunded. We are not going, and, and yet they are the hope in, in many ways of the innovation economy that I'm talking about, because that's where the excellence is. The problem is that you can't keep giving an open checkbook, which is what basically the Labor Party promised in the last federal election, because in the end, who's going to keep paying that? Okay, I understand the argument about $100,000 degrees. I don't like that either. But you pay for it. You all do, right? So you just can't have an open check. On the same time, I don't, you know, I'm not a great fan of, of increasing fees and, and, and privatisation either. But there's got to be a happy model in there somewhere. I can just tell you this, as someone who is a passionate supporter of universities, none of the models are wonderful, but, you, but unless we find a better way to do it, our universities are going to continue to be underfunded. Now that's not going to be helpful because when you consider what's happening in China, now I know they're, they're communists and they have money and all the rest of it that we don't have, but the amount of money they're putting into their research sector, you know, we are going to be left for dead. Now David has Irish, an, Irish ancestry, or from Ireland. Look what the Irish did with all the European money they were prepared to give them. They developed wonderful pharmaceuticals, wonderful research. Money does make the world go round. So we have to put it into our universities. And yes, I get cranky when I see governments cutting funds to universities. But at some point, when the health budget's going through the roof, you've got to find ways to fund these. And that, the whole issue about funding universities, and I don't have the answer, but funding universities has to be a matter of public debate because it will determine our quality of life. You know, uh, Mr. Betty, the, the cost of labor in, in Australia is much higher than in Asia or other countries, okay? Mm, now, um, it, to make uh, Aust Australia's industry less competitive, now, uh, could you comment on this uh, in relation to uh, the com 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 commercialization of technology and in relation to uh, innovation? No, no, you're absolutely effort. right. And in fact, when I went to see the procurement uh, and the general managers of the various companies in Houston, they complained to me that um, we were producing gas at something like $10 per cubic foot or whatever the measurement is. Someone here will know it better than me uh, in Australia. And uh, in, in the US, they were producing it at $3. And they were saying that our costs of production were much too high. And unless we changed it, uh, we would be uncompetitive in 10 years. Now, let's see whether that's right or not. So, yes, you're right. However, let me give you another model. The Germans have, their workers have longer holidays than we do, and they get paid about the same as we do. So what do the Germans do? The reality is the Germans have focused on high tech and innovation. They've gone for the high end manufacturing. So they grow their economy by continuing to invest in what I've talked about today. They've got, a t they've got a TAFE, like, it's not a TAFE, but they've got a tertiary, a, a TAFE type education system as well. I mean, the reality is you can keep a high paying economy running if you continue to innovate and you continue to develop technology. The way to bring down the cost of production is to, to continue to use technology and to innovate. That's why when I talk about manufacturing, look, we're in a lot of trouble with manufacturing. The figures I gave you there show that. But high-level manufacturing is something we can do really well because we're smart. So we have to have an innovative economy. If you can have an innovative economy, you can actually pay people more. The Germans are a good example of it. But look what's happening in China. Their wages are starting to go. Japan was, was a good example of this. Anyone who knows the history of Japan will know that they paid low work, they, they had low wages for a long time, then their wages went up. So what did the Japanese do? They started to innovate and they started to value add. Chinese are going to do the same. Their wages are starting to go up and they can't keep them down. It's all about brain power, technology and innovation. You can continue to maintain our quality of life. What will destroy our cost of living and our quality of life is if we don't innovate. 
then, we, as I said before, we'll be buying other people's technology. That, that's the answer. Oh, we're going to go right up the back, down, the, down to the front, and then into the middle. Right. Over the last 20 years, I've been involved as a medical scientific person with boards in European pharmaceuticals, American and Australian biotech, and research institutes here. And I'm deeply disturbed by experiences of how dysfunctional those boards by and large have been. They've been unwilling to learn and look ahead to see what is happening five, 10, 15 years ahead when it's really obvious. And the sort of things you've seen with the motor industry here and <clears throat> with REM are very good examples of that. I wonder whether you agree and what suggestions you have about our board culture who was he saying was dysfunctional? Oh, yeah. Um, well, look, you and I seem to be on the same wavelength. Um, look, I, I have to admit to a huge degree of frustration about the operation of government, a lot of our institutions, a lot of the debate in this country is short term. You know, I, I'll give you an illustration of frustration. Um, BHP sold a... Uh, a coal mine in uh, uh, Mongolia to Rio Tinto. And, uh, the, you know, the financial writers, the really smart people, were saying how dumb this was because they couldn't understand why Rio would want to buy this uh, coal mine because even though it was next door to China, there weren't transport routes into China. I mean, the Chinese built a railway line in Tibet. I mean, what are we talking about? You know, they, they would build transport links into Mongolia, you know, like falling off a log. And you think, this is the smart people in Australia who are that stupid. And therefore, part of the debate is that our commentators are just too short-sighted. You know, I mean, I even see it in the political debate. Everyone's running around sort of saying, oh, Malcolm Turnbull's not going to get numbers in his own right. And you think, well, hang on. What happens when sitting members and postal vote trends? I've seen this in Queensland all the time. I mean, I'm not trying to be clever. Of course, politics is something I should know something about. I knew that they wouldn't win forward, that all those seats would eventually go back. But here's the, the political geniuses who commentate on all this stuff. You think, what? Really? But that's the problem. It is, it is, it, often our public debate is too narrow, and often our institutions are too narrow. Even our peak bodies, our interest groups, too often they will just look short term. So you're absolutely right. And that's why I say you've got to have four-year terms, you've got to have bi some bipartisanship, and that's why in the end universities and, you know, vice-chancellors, particularly young dynamic ones, actually have got to lead this debate. And too often we just rely on political parties to do it. And what's happening is you look at the membership of all the political parties. They're shrinking. People don't want to be members of anything anymore. My generation, people did everything. They, they were members, they, they participated in the community. Social media is changing all that, and there's good and bad in that. I'm not critical of social media. I use social media all the time, so do my kids. But leadership is difficult. Leadership is something you've actually got to believe in what you're doing, you've got to have a vision, but you've got to take people with you. So I can't disagree with you. I find it incredibly frustrating, frankly. And our problem is this. We are a nimble nation of only 24 million people, but we're really clever, but sometimes our institutions and our leaders are really dumb. Uh, Peter, I just wanted to take you back to the point you were making at the end of your speech about how we've not found a very good way to communicate the benefits of the new economy to those impacted by the old economy. And I think, I mean, you were talking about how Malcolm Turnbull talked about innovation and the science agenda and then stopped. I think it's because it didn't resonate. It, it, in fact, it, it really alienated a lot of people and caused a problem. And Labor did talk about it too. Well, they put the policy settings in place to support that, but they didn't talk about it either. And so we get Pauline Hanson or you get mm. Brexit in the UK or Donald Trump in the US. Like, we don't have a, an economic message that speaks to those impacted by the old oh, economy no, you're right. and, and communicate that. So you were pretty well known as a good communicator when you were Premier in Queensland. Do you have any advice about how we'd better communicate the, the benefits of the new economy to those impacted by the old? Well, I, let me repeat what I said. Peter Reith, 
who's, you know, totally opposite side of politics to me. We, on one of the shows one, one night, we said, all right, well, you tell me what you would do if you were advising the Labor Party. That was him. And you can imagine what that advice was. And I love Peter. <laughs> we get on very well. I hate his politics, but he's a decent person. And I did the other side. And one of the things I said is, look, Malcolm keeps talking about growth and, and, and all the rest of it. What does it mean? Where are the practical examples? And if you're sitting at home and you've just lost your job and you live in, in Mackay and you, your kids are at school, that doesn't mean anything to you. Innovation as a word means nothing. And you're right, it alienated a lot of people because all that sort of Tinseltown stuff, which is how a lot of people see it, didn't practically apply. Let me give you an example. When we started Smart State, of course a lot of money went into universities. My government put several billion in, and with great partners like Chuck Feeney, the Irish American, our greatest philanthropist was an Irish American who gave $300 million to Queensland. What I did was, I said, look, you've got to innovate and this is what you've got to do. I knew that there would be no short-term political gain out of this because, frankly, research takes years unless you're doing medical devices. They can take a bit shorter. But we had a whole broader strategy and we engaged and this sounds really sexist and people will throw things at me. We engage mothers and grandmothers and we actually said, look, if we can find these sorts of things, then you've got to do buildings. And if you get buildings, you need plumbers, you need electricians, you need everybody to build it. You need professional services, you need lawyers, you need accountants. And luckily, we had a scientist who came along and invented Gardasil to prevent cervical cancer, who was a Queenslander. And that changed the dynamic. People thought, oh, OK, I understand what the smart state stuff is all about. But it took a while. What Malcolm did really badly was actually put it in English actually say, this is what it will mean for you. And see, he doesn't talk about the mining industry. I mean, value adding and innovation is not just about medical science, which is obviously one of my passions, but it's about doing the mining industry better, doing mining services. It's about running companies better. It's about better data. It's about professional services. I mean, you know, you saw the figures about service industry. It's all about lawyers doing IP. It's about accountants. It's, it's a broad area. And services that go with it, that's technology, it's IT, it's all that sort of stuff. But Malcolm didn't speak English. He just didn't put it in plain English. So if you're sitting there wondering where your job is, you've got no comfort for Malcolm on it. But the policies he announced, actually, in terms of tax breaks, people who invest get a capital, who don't pay capital gains tax if you leave it in for like six or seven years, whatever it is, really good policies. Because that's where people are likely to take a long-term view. This is what the Americans do. They invest long-term because they'll get a tax break out of it. But he didn't explain it. They stopped talking about it. And, and Bill dropped off it as well. So I just worry about where the agenda is, which means, and this is the point really to answer your question at the back more fully, everybody has to start advocating this who's in a position of leadership. It, it is the vice chancellors, it's, it's, it's people in industry, in, in, in whatever group, people have to start articulating what the important agenda is and it has to be practical. Uh, my question picks up on the themes of your last two responses. Um, your message uh, is very appealing, of course, all your ideas are very attractive and, and they're right, they're in the right sense. Um, but there's, there is resistance to them in the community, especially from the old economy that somebody mentioned over there. Uh, in your own state, you've got a coal mine which is being uh, proved by governments. There are resistance to the implementation of your ideas. Uh, and I know every time you, your last two responses, you've been, you've been enthused about how to, uh, what we should, we should be ignoring all of that and just getting on with the job of Im implementing change. But my question is, how do we get over those resistances? And I'm just wondering whether the media, newspapers, whether they're printed or digital and broadcasting media, which go around the community, are they a mechanism which would help to uh, educate people that change is important and necessary along the lines you're proposing? Uh, or, or is the media full of people who enjoy resisting change? You know, that's, that is actually a really serious and important debate that we have to have. And the reason I say that is, look, I have a show on Sky News every Wednesday night. I commentate for them. I'm part of the problem. Because it's all about 30-second grabs. Media has become 
a battlefield for ratings. And often it's the person who goes to the lowest common denominator. So the things we've talked about tonight are not going to get an airing. So I don't want to sound pessimistic, but I don't think you're going to get a debate in serious media. You may get some of it on the ABC, where you've got, there are some good programs on Radio National. Sky does occasionally do good, good shows, because I drive some of this stuff. But it's all become the quick grab. And one of the problems is that technology has undermined journalism. Because what's happened is that a lot of the newsrooms don't have journalists anymore. And often people will pick up Twitter and they will use that as the news grab. And it may turn out to be totally wrong. So where is the sort of journalistic analysis that will enable serious articles to be written? And if you look at some of the papers, when Heather and I were living in New York, we loved reading the New York Times because they had great writers and serious articles. But all those papers are losing money. Newspapers are dead. So the only response that I can give you of hope, because I'm pessimistic about that, I don't think you're going to get a lot of help from the media, frankly. And I'm someone who, who's never had problem with the media in my life, because I've obviously you know, gone out and been frank and upfront with them. But social media also offers opportunities. It does offer communication through Facebook with serious writers. The problem with social media, though, is often we just talk to our own people of similar, similar views. And often there's not a cross-fertilisation to convince people or to educate people about what the options are. That's part of the problem. Which then comes back, well, who, should, who provides leaders, leadership in this? I have to say, I think our major institutions have to lead on this, and they have to pre pressure politicians into good policy. Because I believe good policy is good government, and, and politi political leaders then have to go out and argue it and articulate it. That's the only way that I think you'll get change. But I'm, you didn't put it in a pessimistic way, uh, and I don't know whether you're pessimistic about the media or not, but I am quite pessimistic about an educative role. Because in a democracy, where do you get your information from? It comes from the media. Therefore, the quality of what's reported is really important to all of us. And I don't have the faith I had. And I know people, when you get old, you tend to say it was better when I was a kid. Well, the truth is, journalism was better. It was better. And I don't know the answer to that other than using social media, having our major institutions like universities playing that role. That's why I keep talking about universities. I see them as a key driver of not just the future in terms of research, commercialising and jobs and new innovation, but also taking the community with it. Because the problem is what media has done is created huge cynicism about politicians. And it becomes the stupid getcher of the day. You know, I mean, you see the exaggeration. I, 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 Heather and I talk about this sometimes. You see, it happens to everybody. I saw it happen in the campaign where Malcolm Turnbull said something and it was beaten. You just shake your head and say, well, look, he clearly didn't mean that. Bill Shorten did the same thing. It becomes the gotcha line of the day because they want you to look at the story or look at the pa web page. But it doesn't add anything. Last question from the floor and then we're going to take it upstairs and we'll continue questions thereafter. I'm just wondering, Peter, if you could, um, we, you, were, you were saying um, we have to be nimble, we have to be quick, we have to be flexible, we have to be innovative, we have to do this now um, because I gather from what you're saying that, you know, the time is now, it's sort of getting pretty urgent that we do it a lot is. of these, this stuff. So my question is um, around education. So. If we're going to do all this, we need kids who are able to take up the challenge. So what do we need to do? Are our education systems um, um, flexible enough, adaptive? I ask this because in the 1980s, there was about 25% or so of the population employed on a casual or part-time basis. Now that's risen to around about 50%. And, and I see keep problems increasing. there. So are we equipping our kids um, for the challenges of the future? I think the, most, I think the most important thing we can teach our kids is to actually cope with change and to have a flexible education system that enables them to be able to cope with change. Because I know this is a trade-off line, but you know, Heather and I have a grandson who's 14 months old 
I have no idea what sort of job he will have when he's 20, nor does anyone else, because the world is going to change. What we have to do is educate him to be able to think outside the box and to adapt and come up with innovative ways to whatever job exists. But the point you made at the beginning about the rate of change, the world is going to continue to accelerate in the rate of change. I mean, you think of how long the internet's been around, you think of how long iPhones have been around. These are not very long. And the rate of change is accelerating, and China's going to drive that even faster as they continue to innovate, as their population becomes more educated. Look, I think we've got good educators generally in this country. I think we should focus more on maths and science and engineering, to be honest with you. And one of the reasons why China is driven so much by innovation is that most of the communist leaders have been engineers or people with those sort of skills, and that's influenced how the Politburo thinks. Uh, I mean, that's just a reality. A lot of them came out of Shanghai, and that was the nature of the city. So we need... I think our teachers, obviously, are underpaid. Uh, we don't pay our teachers enough. Um, you know, it's the most important role. Teachers, when I was a kid, were a lot more respected than they are now. I think that's sad. I think they should be paid better. I think we should demand better standards, better performances, which is really hard. Teachers' unions hate that, but in the essence, that's really important because that's the formative years. Look, I guess I'm not really answering your question other than to simply say to you that the education system has to continue to be flexible. Teach our kids how to educate themselves and, and you see it as a life experience. Can I give you this as my book? Because I don't, I don't want to be accused of taking money from the University of South Australia. I'm going to give them their own... Now, um, ladies and gentlemen, normally I just say to the speaker, thank you very much, and we wrap up and we go upstairs and, uh, and we have a, a, a bit of a drink. Um, the questions tonight were so aligned to this institution and the way in which we do business, and also to my role as the chair of the Australian Technology Network of Universities, that I think if I didn't take the opportunity to, to just make a few comments about what we heard tonight before I do a little vote of thanks. Um, there's not very many discourses that we record in this theatre that I could actually show to my council as justification for the decisions that this institution makes. We're building a $230 million health innovation building across the road, which is going to focus on pharmaceutical innovation, and in which we have partner laboratories with pharmaceutical industries in China embedded in that program. On the ground floor, there's going to be an outreach facility for STEM, which is going to be free. Not the Science Investigator Centre of old, where you used to push a button and figure out why the light came on, but an area wherein you're going to be inspired about science and encouraged to take a path into scientific creativity and uh, innovation, because that's what will build future economies. It takes a long time to change an economy. And people often think that you're going to switch off the old and lose it all, and then the new will suddenly spring up overnight. I'll give you an example from uh, the Irish economy where we were a low-cost manufacturing base. And IBM manufactured mainframe computers in a place called Mulhuddard, which is in North County Dublin. It's the only place I could afford to buy a house uh, when, the, uh, when the, the property boom was on. It was about an hour and a half commute into the city centre. Mulhuddard was where IBM made mainframe computers. And then the cost of living went up, and the cost of wages went up, and it was a hell of a lot cheaper to make it outside Ireland. They transitioned that facility to a service facility for software development because the economy was producing software engineers who were savvy, who spoke English, who could translate their technologies into software to be exported and they became their global European headquarters for software. And it had nothing to do with tax incentives because that ship had long sailed for IBM. They were already 40 years in the company, in the country at that stage. When you talk about prioritization of investment around fundamental and applied or near market research versus basic, the most important thing to do is to say what you're going to invest. What percentage of our investment nationally will be near market? What percentage will sustain fundamental research into the future? And you cannot turn off one for, because it's at the expense of the other. There was a mathematician called uh, William Rowan Hamilton in the 1840s, super genius. He was made a professor when he was 19 years of age, and he ran the National Observatory in a cloudy country, so he had a difficult job. <laughs> he used to walk 
to his observatory every day from the city centre in Dublin out to uh, where Dunsink, where the observatory was. And one day as he passed a bridge, he had a flash of inspiration. He was working on a mathematical equation, and this was 1845, he didn't have a biro, didn't have a notebook. So he took out his pen, or his penknife, and he etched the formula for his equation, the solution of his equation, into the wall of the bridge. It was called the Quaternions, Hamiltonian Quaternions. And that fundamental inspiration had no application until Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, 124 years later. Now, if he applied for a grant in 1845 <laughs> and said, I think my mathematics will put men on the moon, uh, nobody's going to fund them. It's important to preserve the fundamental because it gives you the applied. And you cannot lose sight of the fact that the investment that we make as the public in research should not be a surrogate for industry investing in its own research. We have to augment it. We have to accelerate it. We have to build institutes like the one we're building across the road. It's why we have a future industries institute in Mawson Lakes, because it's the complementarity of an ecosystem that gives you competition and gives you a competitive edge. This is a small economy on the edge of a very, very big economy that can service Asia. We're very, very bright people. I think federation does get in the way of us making nimble decisions. That's an observation having been here for three and a half years. I think if we can get ourselves connected, and we can connect through the Future Fund and get the leverage that's there, we can translate great innovation into commercialization. And we should always do it through the lens of for benefit, societal and economic. And the two things go hand in hand together. So I will be showing my council your, uh, your, 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 the whole podcast, which will be available on the Hawk website, because everything you've said there, Peter, today actually resonates with us as an institution which prides itself to be a university of enterprise. I will read your book, because I think I, I, the, the, the course you're setting out is, is so interesting and so relevant uh, for today. And as you can see, it is available as an e-book online at Strictly, li Strictly li Literary, which is very hard to say with an Irish accent. We are going to thank our speaker, Peter Beattie, in the normal way. I'm going to ask you all to make your way upstairs uh, to, the, uh, to the gallery where we will be having some refreshments and we can consider, uh, continue, our, continue our conversation with Peter uh, into the uh, late hours of the evening. Thank you all for your uh, entertainment.